these are many of the name plates throughout the years from the races. Uh, this isn't even, this is a really small percentage of the nameplates actually because I had a whole lot that I just couldn't keep track of. Went through so many of them. Here's the team's business card. I'm keeping this forever. Here's my wristband from the one day in 2019 when I decided that I should jump a 30 foot jump when I had no former experience in 30 feet long jumps. This in a lot of ways was a bit of a break for me it kind of started making me more relevant in the team. Here's my first year jersey. <laughs> it's quite an interesting design. It got too small for me a while ago. Here are my relatively minimal awards considering I never actually podiumed in a race. Here's a mug for all you mug enjoying people. Look, I got a cup, I got a coach's award, and I got an attitude award which is like the biking equivalent of participation award. And um, then the next year I got it again but it was big this time. It's, it's larger. It was larger that year. And um, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> this is the Duckfoot Award. I got this my first year riding for the team. And um, it's kind of, it's funny, it's when you ride with your toes pointed outwards. And um, if you just look at that, that's my picture. There I am, riding in my sweatpants because my dad made me wear them because it was a little chilly I would not have collected all this stuff if it didn't mean something to me I don't have a whole lot to my name but one thing that I cherish the most is the bikes I spent most of my childhood being a weirdo. And I'm still a weirdo, but now I'm a weirdo with friends. In seventh grade, I started mountain biking competitively on the cop based Alatuna Creek team, even though I didn't live in the area because I didn't know the Paulding team existed. Jamie Youngblood, the head coach of the Paulding team, would see me riding with the other team and try to get my attention to no avail, as I would ride on, thinking they had called somebody else's name, as who would need my attention. But he called for me because he wanted me. He knew I lived and rode in Paulding, and he saw the potential in the strange, long-haired 11-year-old on his bright red bike. That year was the first year of PC Connell. They were a ragtag team grown from a couple people who met on the Silver Comet, and they were hungry for new talent. Through family and friends, they had amassed a couple good coaches and a couple good riders, and I was next. I joined PC Comp in 2018 as an 8th grader, and was met with more than a mountain bike team more than a group of people who trained together, I was met with a welcoming group who had become more or less my family as the years passed. Yeah, David. My first race on the team and my second race ever, I had placed 13th out of around 200 kids, and I, 
along with my coaches and teammates, were thrilled to see what progress I would make from there. I never felt better because, like most nerds, through all the sports I had tried, I would never really found one that I liked and was good at. But this was something else. I had been riding bikes since I was four, and I found it to be a source of true happiness unlike anything else. I was so happy to be routinely taking part in and being competitive in something that I loved so much. And I was anxious to see the results I would get with more training and determination. But that was about to be halted. Four days after my first race, I broke my collarbone out of practice and was out for two months. I had broken it around three miles into the trail, therefore it wasn't feasible for me to walk all the way out of the trail with my arm clutched to my chest. So my coach, Josh Camp, cut around the park with his Jeep and parked it in a nearby neighborhood. We had to cut through the woods and through some yards to get back to the Jeep, and when one of the homeowners came out on the porch wondering why we were cutting through their yard, Josh said my son had broken his collarbone out on the trail. His son. Now I know he didn't mean it to be taken seriously, but for some reason it meant, it meant a lot. With my collarbone being broken right after the first race, it caused me to miss three out of the five races, where I would come just to watch and cheer on the team. Hey Peyton! Go Peyton! Go Peyton, go Peyton, go Peyton! But a week before the last race, I was cleared to ride. So I trained like there was no tomorrow and prepared to ride in my last race of the season. The coaches always facilitated my progress in times of need like this. Even if I weren't realistically going to do the team much good in terms of its standings, they just wanted to see me succeed. And they did. My first race back I had passed 61 people, going from 84th place to 23rd, and I reveled in the success. I couldn't have done it without the coaches who supported me. Through the years, I would experience several more broken bones, family separation, extreme brokenness, and more general turmoil, and their team's support never wavered, even when I did. My coaches never failed to pick me up and support me by providing me with bikes to ride when mine was broken, paying for meals when I couldn't afford to, and including me, even when I wasn't feeling great or entirely sociable. There's this overarching theme of riders and coaches alike helping each other out without being asked. Sticking with a fallen rider, supplying a rider with water in the middle of the race, or simply just riding behind a less experienced rider and giving good coaching. This extends beyond just during practices and stuff. This extends to times like when Tucker Beasley and I were in Knoxville, and I had popped my tire in the bad part of town several miles away from the hotel we were staying in, and he stuck with me the whole way back, despite the fact that I was slowly walking my bike and his bike went totally fine. These people, I found at a time when I didn't know of anybody who would ever consistently have my back like they do. I didn't know where to find them, because I'd looked pretty far and wide to no avail. But here, I had found some wonderful people who had been sitting under my nose this whole time. In short, it's useful to be able to focus it and really check the world around you because what you're seeking may be right behind you. If I had lost faith in my community, I wouldn't have found these people. I may not fit in really, but that's the great thing about this group. 
I might be a weirdo nerd, but they love me for that. I learned a lesson in giving even the most unassuming people around me a chance. As much as you feel like you don't fit into the world around you, there's people all around who are more than willing to welcome you into their little sphere of the world. Much like my redneck friends did with me. So be nice to people. Give people a piece of your time. They may just be the next reason you keep going. There's very little things that make me happy. When they make me happy, they make me so happy. This is good stuff. I'm falling over. This is a moment that I'll probably never get to experience again. Josh, say something evil over the fire. Like sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> That's incredible, dude. I like that one.